nice to be here today to uh, discuss the continuing effects of the uh, electric universe concepts. Um, the title of my presentation, Geometry of Earth's Endogenous Electrical Energy, Geophysical Evidence. Endogenous is uh, just for internal origin is the, uh, the term that that means, because it's not a very familiar term. I wanted to kind of give you an overview of what I'm going to try to present in this presentation. I'm trying to develop some geometry to understand a conceptual framework to uh, comprehend some of these electrical universe concepts. And um, first I want to show some basic alert, uh, circuits tied to platonic solids. It's an artistic approach inspired by Frank Chester. Um, also include a Wikipedia version for thoroughness, a little geometric progression. And um, then I relate it to a classical physics approach of the general Cowling's dynamo theorem. And then I try to weave that into real world examples uh, to decipher some relationships of uh, this internal energy. And then I try to relate that to earthquakes, lightning, hurricanes, climate change, and show you the interrelationships of how it's tied to that in, on our planet. Um, I don't get into the solar activity relationships this year, but last year, if you saw the Earth as a stellar transformer, that's where I tie the solar activity into this, but I'm, I'm not going to focus on that today. Oh, here we go. The geophysical evidence is going to be somewhat tied to these. This is your basic tetrahedron, your three-sided pyramid, with your basic Y circuit at the top and a delta circuit at the bottom, this triangle at the bottom. So this is your basic building block of what I'm going to talk about today. The Platonic solids. You, again, you see the tetrahedron with the Y circuit at the top and the base of the pyramid as a delta circuit. So this is your fire element, it basically a, a, the basic electric component of all of these platonic solids are built on this. Um, we're going to look at this in the next slide, the pentagon shape of the ether. And this is a... Um, provides a simple yet elegant conceptual framework for understanding uh, or exploring the Earth's electrical geometry. There's your build on the, the pentagon shape. It was pretty quick, but um, you saw that in the ether. And then I'd zoom into the Earth. You see a hexagonal feature at the North Pole, and you see the triangle in the center and I show a relation to John Quinn's magnetic um, there you go that triangle in the middle so these are multi-phase circuits it looks like at the at the North Pole and what kind of inspired me to look into this was because I'd look at climate change I knew that these I have them labeled as hot but these, the tips of this equilateral triangle, when I notice this relationship, are all tied to climate change. This, the Alaskan low, is teleconnected to the Siberian high. This is over uh, Lake Bakal, or Bakal, in Siberia. There's a high pressure center that sits right over this all the time. There's a low pressure that sits over the Aleutians right here. And over Iceland, there's a, another low pressure center which is teleconnected to an Azor high pressure cell that controls European weather patterns. You see the, I call these dual antenna um, based on Giovanni Grigori's theory, but um, after hearing Dr. Scott's lecture in last uh, presentation, these may be the anode tufts or photospheric tufts. Um, have to look into that a little bit more, but there, there's the analogy 
to these features um, that we've been calling jewel spikes uh, based on our sea urchin spikes, based on the biological model of Giovanni. And if you notice these offsets to a deeper blue layer, this is where your double layer, if you look at the depths over here, you have the reds are shallow. So you have a, a Z pinch here between these that connects the deep double layer to the shallow upper level in the mantle. And these look like they are related to the, uh, the anode tufts, or we call them dual antenna, but we don't want to be too confusing with all these terms. But this is what I believe is the uh, multi-phase circuitry of the delta circuit configuration at the North Pole. And if you look, you have a depression here in the Arctic Ocean. The Gackle Ridge, this is the Gackle Ridge, a rift right at the uh, North Pole. At the south, you have the raised continent of Antarctica. So it creates a dimple and a point, okay? And that's the shape of the heart shape. And we're gonna relate that more to uh, the human heart in a bit more, but I just wanted to show you that relationship Let's see if I missed anything. Oh, I wanted to show you this other delta, this one. Now, this one I, I picked out because of the pressure oscillation systems. But this one I just turned to create the star, the six-pointed star. So I just rotated it, and it came out at these other tectonic features. This is the tip of the Aleutians in Kamchatka. And you notice an interesting connection to Hawaii. So these may be electrical conduits. This is the Hudson Bay, a, a large depression area in North America. And then you have the Caspian Sea over here, which is on this, I consider this a vortex street through the Mediterranean. Anyway, so the, the geometry comes out on these tectonic features. And we'll talk about that a little bit more. But I'm still focused on the geometry so we'll look at, we got the fire element here, the three-sided pyramid. Over here, put that in a sphere. And what you see is that, you know, one point easily hits the top of the sphere. These other points also hit the circle down here, but there's this large gap. If you put two tetrahedrons in there and in invert one, then you have what I consider Y circuits at all the points. But if you look at the, a, a common quartz crystal, then this one is faceted. You see the facets. So, so they've shaved this off a bit. But it, you can see these pronounced deltas inside the quartz crystal. And this could be an inverted tetrahedron. It could be some other geometry that explains it. But this is your double delta circuit, which is just like I showed you at the, uh, the North Pole. And it's within quartz, just uh, all your common quartz crystals. This is the Wikipedia evolution of um, the geometry. And they call it a diminished tr trigonal trapezohedron. That's a mouthful, DTT. But Basically, the, the, a common, what they call a special case, is your cube. The way you, um, well, one of the problems I had is that I was trying to figure out how you get a dipole from the tetrahedron because all the Ys were pointed in every direction. There was no delta. So how do you get a delta? Well, you have to shave off one of the apexes. And if you do that, you come up with this um, gyro elongated tri triangular pyramid. It has 10 equilateral triangles, three at the top, one at the base, and then six that come around the circle this area. If you convert these six tr equilateral triangles into three kites, you come up with another special case called the chestahedron. Now, as I said this, uh, I was inspired to look into this by uh, 
video I watched uh, by Frank Chester. And uh, we'll, we'll review that again in a minute. But you see at the top here you have a delta. And then you have your Y here at the base. So it's a convenient geometry to explain the dipole. And uh, that's what I was trying to find. There's some other concepts. The trees of life have this similar configuration. But then, so back to this, you see, this all has the Ys. If you look at the points, those are Y circuits. So where's the delta? Well, if you look how a chestahedron fits into the globe, you see the gap up here, but the point here. And again, this is what creates this structure of uh, the heart shape. You have the point at the South Pole. Uh, Antarctica is a raised continent. And you have the dimple at the North Pole, a sinking effect. And we think this is tied to the energy flow through the planet. So the chestahedron fits, in my opinion, better than other geometry that I've looked at. This uh, is one of the websites you can see, uh, see some videos that explain this in more depth. I don't have time to go through his full explanation, but it's, it's pretty interesting. This slide shows you the basic relationship to the electronic circuits. There's your delta circuit, your Y circuit, again, the tip and the base of the chestahedron. Um, Giovanni, or Giovanni, explains this as the internal way. This induction method in the deep earth that's a bit mysterious. We, we've analyzed the energy flow through this pretty well. We've satellite data and all types of observational data sees this. But this is a bit mysterious, but I believe it's controlled by this type of geometry. review the geometry a little bit more. I'm going to beat this horse a little bit. But there's your sculpture. Uh, this is a chestahedron sculpture. If you spin this, you get this bell shape. And you can see that it creates a hole or a dimple or a vortex well on this end. And again, you have the your tip here. So the spinning chestahedron creates your polar topography. So that's what, that's what we're looking at is those relationships. Um, I don't know, y'all can try that, you know, if you want to try the heart shape to see how that feels, you can um, do that. Frank Chester does a much better job of explaining their relationships to the human heart. And then I want to look at how that's tied to some classical physics information. Um, you have your, your basic electric dipole plus your magnetic dipole or toroidal. And that, if you put these two together, you create the anipole. This feature uh, has a configuration, kind of like a, a human brain cut cross section about here. But if you relate that to Cowling's generalized dynamo theorem, you see that the unstable configuration has an electric field at the toroidal, and these polar or poloidal fields or magnetic is an unstable configuration. The magnetic field in the center, electric fields in the poloidal are stable. It's like the Earth, magnetic field with electrical fields. The unstable, I have an analogy that works to understand this a little bit. If you had, um, these are your magnetic fields, I'm sorry, electric fields. Well, let's say magnetic, let's see. This is the stable configuration, magnetic fields. But if you have um, electric field in the middle of two magnetic fields, that's your unstable configuration. So this is where you get a collapse of your lightning 
and expansion through the chestahedron. Remember, expanding goes through the delta circuit. Collapsing is through the Y. So if you collapse the energy, lightning goes into the earth. You could almost draw this. Let's see if I can do that. If you have a... There's your Y at the base. We'll just draw this one up there. And somewhere up in the ionosphere is your delta. So the energy condenses or collapses towards the earth and expands away from the earth into, into the ionosphere. Go back to this. We're looking at um, these, we call these Joule antenna. Um, Anno tufts works for me, or photospheric tufts. As far as the charge goes, um, we're looking at relationships to atmospheric pressure, high pressure and low pressure. So those might be the uh, anode versus the photospheric tufts. In any event, um, at the tips of these features are mantle vortexes. Um, if you look at basic topography, you'll see yin-yang structures in several places on the planet. The Band of Sea is one area I've looked at. It. At the tip of the Indonesian island arc, there's this huge swirl fe feature. And the low pressure cell of El Nino sits right over it all the time. On the other side of the Pacific, say over here, is the uh, Easter Island, where the high pressure sits over Easter Island all the time. And the oscillation between those two pressure modulates the jet stream patterns, which drives the El Nino. So I think it's internally modulated by this electronic effect. And it's tied to surface expressions of mantle vortexes and plate tectonics. They call this um, triple junctions in plate theory. Um, a new theory or a newer theory, uh, surge tectonics, considers them as vortex structures. So a little review of the geology. Um, triple junctions you could think of as the tip of a chestahedron or a, uh, it's a, it's a Y circuit. So if you look at a, a plate tectonic map, you'll see where the Ys are located. And I, I can get into that a little bit more in a minute. But let's go back to the geometry a bit. Now this is where it's very difficult to explain the addition of another chestahedron to this. But the single chestahedron, if it rotates one direction, the, uh, either the electronics are actually, as I showed you on the North Pole, you had the two double deltas. If you had two of these chestahedrons together, that's when you get the double, the double delta. That expressed quartz crystals. But if you relate that to the human heart, you see what they call an, ex an inline or a expanding vortex structure with the Y at the tip. And you have to spin this, otherwise it, you won't see it. But, and then the collapsed vortex. And this feature is very common if you start looking at things in, with this perspective. You see this shape. And um, so there's a Y here, a Y here. There's a bit of an offset. And I want to show how that relates to the South Pole. This was um, in my last year's presentation. I mentioned the Y circuits at the South Pole. Didn't talk about the North Pole last year, but looking at uh, Quinn's magnetic model, again, you're looking at the shallow and the reds and yellows, and the deep double layer here. It's pretty much offset where the um, change in the um, magnetic field goes from positive to negative along this double layer, pretty close. And you see, I consider these where the the circuits, in other words, there's a Y circuit here and a Y circuit here. The solar connection is through that. The solar connection is in the middle, but it's connected across two of these Y structure, two of these um, jewel antenna, anatode tufts, to develop your Ys. So there's Ys here, 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 
which relates to your offset of the double chestahedron. And then the next coat rotating layer out here on your mantle ridge that goes all the way around Antarctica, which provides your transformer effect to the plasma, where you get your step down energies. There's your next co-rotating layer and the next set of Y, uh, next set of dual antenna that connect your, make your Y circuit with the sun. And again, over here, you have another one on this side, close to uh, where the South Pole actually manifests. The ring here, if you notice this bright spot, that's associated with a, a tectonic feature right here. And we think this increased brightness indicates some type of energy transfer to the tectonics or the core or through an, an upper mantle circuit. And um, I want to relate this collapsed vortex feature or this double chestahedron, rotating double chestahedron to some, some things you might be familiar with. Most of you have seen the magnetic hoops or the energy on the sun, the coronal mass ejections, your co-rotating layers, and what I call Tesla streams, connection back to the sun. But the great sand dunes near Alamosa, Colorado exhibit a similar structure. You see a feature here in the sand dunes, it looks like a collapsed vortex. And you see your area here. now. This is caused by wind, winds that rotate around the mountains, what they call the thermals that come up, people hang glide and stuff up there, and then it comes back. But there's also a, a vortex set up here of your wind shears coming across the mountain. So you have a um, fairly stable vortex set up by the topography that create this feature of the sand dunes. And real streams, are on both sides of this. So it looks like an analogous um, type of feature controlled possibly by the same geometry. Um, what was interesting about this is, um, Mick, are you out there? Mick Davis, our, uh, our executive director, me and him were driving to uh, Alamosa and we stopped by the Great Sand Dunes. His son was in the Boy Scouts. They were having a jamboree. We stopped by for a visit, went to the visitor center, and we had just been talking about these collapsed vortex structures on the drive down. And we went to the uh, visitor center, and we were looking at a map of the sand dune. And I said, hey, Mick, you see that feature there? We were just talking about that. And that's kind of how we noticed this relationship. So. It was just happenstance that I, I introduced this in this topic because we just happened to be driving down there to look at uh, some other things. But now I want to show you how this relates to polar aura. Again, you see in the polar aura, you see these collapsed vortex features. There's your north and your south poles, your double layer, your Tesla streams. And you notice that here's your day-night time boundary. And I'm going to show you an animation so you'll see the relationship. But this day-night time boundary, this fat part of the donut, always points towards the night, towards midnight. Whereas the opening is always pointed towards the sun. And what I started thinking about was what causes that? Is that just a solar wind effect? Or is there something deeper related to this? And it dawned on me that possibly the inner core is attracted towards the sun, while the outer core keeps this shape. And what you're looking at in the aura is like an MRI, a magnetic resonant image of the inner and outer core relationships through the aura. So with that concept, I thought I'd think about that a little harder. And um, let's see, what my next slide? I started thinking about how the circuits that I looked at earlier, how that was related. 
And I can review this again. This was in last year's uh, presentation, but your Y circuit's at the South Pole, Delta circuit's at the North, connected through the ridge structures. These Pacific rise being a, what I consider a hot circuit. And so is the Southeast Indian Ridge. And the return, I believe, is in these cooler ridges. So you have the return flow back towards the south. So this is where your currents are, your dominant currents on the planet. And what's interesting is also this is, looks like an inline feature versus a collapse feature. This runs to the west before it heads up north. I'll show you a gravity map in a minute that makes it a little bit easier to see. But it looks like in the mantle, you're also seeing a reflection of the inner outer core geometry, the chestahedron geometry, as you are in the aurora. So you get repeating geometry in the different layers. And um, if you look, this is where your Aleutian low, remember I talked about the Aleutian low, the uh, delta at the North Pole, Iceland's right here, and Lake Baikal is or that high pressure. So you see the delta relationship between these electrical circuits seem to be connected. Let's see, I have any other items. Okay, so one more concept is that as this Earth is spinning through these magnetic fields set up by the outer, inner and outer core, and the same feature repeats in the plasma sphere, the compression on the solar side, the tail on the, um, on the away side from the sun. So you have that same feature in the plasma sphere, you have it in the mantle, you have it in the inner and outer core. The Earth is rotating through that magnetic field and it simply excites the electrical energy by the induction processes that rotates through these fields. And so you're, you're seeing, um, lightning and earthquake data that are related to this relationship. I'll, I'll show you the animation here. So you can see that the fat part of the donut stays uh, towards the night side, towards the midnight. And really as the sun, if you look at a heliocentric model, you're seeing the sun here and the earth is spinning they do just the opposite. They keep the Earth still here and spin the magnetic, or the aurora. But it, it's just a relativistic thing. And I wanted you to see that the donut shape does point towards the midnight. And there's an interesting phenomena, a lightning phenomena. Make sure. I'm associated with that. Uh, this is the Catatumba lightning. And this is at the mouth of uh, a, a, a lake in Venezuela. And this lightning display begins at dusk, right after dark. It peaks at midnight is when it's most intense, and then it dissipates towards dawn. Happens all the time, almost every night. There's a relationship to when it shuts down sometimes. They think it's related to an El Nino phase. But this is a, day, a nightly display. And the fact that it peaks at midnight, um, I think the spin of these electric circuits, the East Pacific rise is connected to this area. I'll show you that in the gravity map in a minute. So it looks like lightning intensity and timing may be tied to this effect. look at the global lightning. This is a um, what they call annual flash rate. Uh, this is from NASA satellite data. You're looking at uh, about eight years worth of what they call composite, annualized composite data. So you see a huge concentration in the Congo. So you see your, your intensity here. This is the most lightning at the top, the dark. You also see, here's your Katamba that we just talked about right at the, um, in Venezuela, Tampa Bay Lightning in Gulf of Mexico, have a little spot up here in the, near the Himalayas, Uruguay, Argentina, 
relationship to lightning down here. But I wanted to, sh I just showed you the relationship to the Katamba lightning. I wanted to talk a little bit more about what's going on up here in Tampa Bay. After I talk about the relationships to the mantle gravity. This is uh, from GRACE satellite data and they show the mantle gravity anomalies by mathematically stripping away the crust or the lithosphere. And you're seeing this feature here is your east-pacific rise circuit. You're seeing the inner fingering. You see a tip of a chestahedron right here. But as you come here, is it kind of inner fingers into the continent is where the lightning seems to be connected to these circuits in the mantle. You also have a connection here through the Cayman Trough and up through the Bahamas back to Tampa Bay. And then in the Congo, the Southeast Indian Ridge, if you follow it past this feature, triple junction, come around to this feature, another tip of a chestahedron. And then the African Rift, this is where the lightning is right next to this feature. So another connection to this ridge. And here, is, you see this is a little better. Uh, this is your inline versus your collapsed repeating geometry. Let's see if I got. So to me, this is the most pronounced feature of uh, this triple junction here. Y circuit sticking straight up through the, uh, this is the ocean of course. There's um, it's a Red Sea Rift, right? And you see these features are quite common. There's one in the Indian Ocean, the Rodriguez Triple Junction. One here at Galapagos up here closer to the U.S. offshore. So these features are fairly common. Now let's get to a little bit, let's analyze what was going on with the lightning up in Tampa Bay. I have some interesting ideas about that. This is John Quinn's magnetic model data. Here he's, um, it models basalt flow remnants. Here's your colors. Um, the red and yellow are shallower, 30 to 70 kilometers, while your deep green and Blues, there's your range, 70 to 400 kilometers. There's your double layer, deep double layer with the upper, upper mantle, um, positive layer. So I zoom in to Florida to look at the relationships of these jewel antenna, we'll call them that today, on either side of Florida, and surface magnetic data from USGS, the crustal signatures, even shallower than these features. You see an ancient Triassic rift that runs through Florida. This was what they consider responsible for opening of the Gulf of the Mexico back in the Triassic. They're associated with iron, red beds, and such like that. If you, from drill data, they, they know what's in down there. But you see this feature runs right across through Tampa Bay, and it's kind of connected to the Bahamas. But this is uh, shallow. So lightning would ground to these anomalies in here, and it's like a bridge that connects these two deeper features, which have connections to the core. So there's your, your grounding connections, and you can see them with the magnetic data. And what got me curious about this was, um, The 2004 hurricane season, you had three hurricanes that intersected just east of Tampa Bay. And I was curious about that. That was intriguing. Um, Charlie came in from the Gulf side, and Jeannie and Francis both came in through near Abaco, Bahamas, and came up through, caught the edge of the Gulf. So I said, what? This could possibly be going on with the intersection of three hurricanes here. Kind of curious about that. So I, I talked to Visala. They run the U.S. Lightning Detection Network. I think they're located out in Tucson. But 
they were kind enough to share this histogram of lightning strike data for these years, uh, 96 through 2004. And what you see is about a half million strikes in a, it's about a two degree area that's around Tampa. I'll show you the plots in a minute to orient you, but you get a little bit more, um, on average, a little bit over half a million strikes up until this year, 2003, the year right before you had the three hurricanes strike in the area. And I was looking at this chart here. This is a, a century's worth of data, 1900 to 2000. John Quinn used five-year running averages or models to create this curve, your Earth's magnetic moment decay. So your magnetic field is increasing, decreasing, increasing, decreasing. We're associating this with a discharging and a charging effect. And I have this down here, which is the Pacific Decadal Oscillation. This is considered the largest global temperature proxy on the planet. It's a horseshoe's temperature pattern that goes from a U-shape in the northern Pacific to an L-shaped uh, over here by Caruso and the intertropical convergence. And then you get the U along uh, California when it's positive, and it goes back to the L-shape when it's a cooler or a cooling trend. And it's interesting that the inflection points turn with the magnetic decay. But what's even more curious is here, when it goes from discharging to charging, is when your lightning doubled. Now, Tampa Bay has more lightning than anywhere in the North America. So for it to double in one year in a place that already has more lightning than anywhere in North America is pretty interesting. What causes that? So we think the reason is right here, because the Earth discharging and goes back to a charging effect. The reasons behind all this, I don't have time to go into that today, but there, there's just some suspected reasons. This is the blue, what we're looking at here is the positive strokes versus all the strokes, the green being negative, uh, cloud to ground, negative polarity. Um, what Weisselis says about the positive strokes is that the charges lowers from the cloud before you get the, the strike. Whether well, it's actually coming from the ground, I, have, I couldn't get them to admit that it was coming from the ground, and I don't know, but they consider the charge lowers from the cloud, so you get a attraction from the ground before you get the strike. But that's what is represented by the blue. And they gave me two separate plots. They plotted the total and the positive. And I'll show you what that looks like. This is the chart of all the data, and you see a concentration just at the mouth of Tampa Bay. This is where the hurricane's intersection was, right in the middle of this circle. Well, when you plot the positive strokes over here, here's, here's what they say about the convention of lightning polarity, charge being lowered from the cloud. You see a shift inland along the peninsular arch of Florida, and you get two distinct uh, concentrations of lightning. So if you take these two charts and you add them together and plot it all together, the reason you don't see, you wouldn't see this unless you only plotted the positive, but consider a delta circuit between the two positive concentrations and the negative or the lightning, uh, the cloud to ground lightning here. So you have a negative and two positive poles in your triangle. So another delta circuit in the lightning configuration. To me that was highly interesting. And then I wanted to relate that to earthquakes. Again, this is uh, tied to your East Pacific Rise circuit. This is a clustered burst. You have uh, two distinct cl 
clusters of earthquakes. This is off the coast of, this is the Peruvian Trench here. So these squares are about the same area. I zoomed in a little bit more on this one. But all these earthquakes occurred in about a three-day period. This is, this is November 11th, 1996. This was associated with the beginning of a hail cycle, the 22-year solar sunspot cycle. The um, earthquakes are plotted, I plotted the earthquakes for, these are several years, 96 to 2003. So this is uh, about seven years worth of earthquake data. You see this huge spike here associated with this spike. We just calculated from the joule, uh, the Richter values, you can calculate the joule energy. This is an exponent. So you see a big spike associated with this. There's just this little teeny one with this little earthquake that happened later. But when this energy was released at the base of the mantle, it takes some time for what they call transmigration of the thermal heat through the crust. And you see about six months later, you get this sea surface temperature anomaly max sea surface temperature anomaly. And that's what these are. You see two distinct sea surface temperature anomalies in black here. And one of them is down on the slope. One of them's further up on the shelf, which is the same geospatial relationship of the two distinct clusters. A fellow named Daniel Walker um, at the University of Hawaii has looked into earthquake relationships to El Nino and he reported that every El Nino he sees six month precursor earthquakes. This isn't the only ones, there's all over the Pacific Basin that he sees these increases. But we went to look for them and this was a, an example we found. And uh, he finds them after, uh, before every El Nino. And that got me curious, why is there a relationship between climate and earthquakes? So that's what got us looking into this. This was several years back. If you look at the full-blown temperature anomaly of, a, of what they consider the full-blown El Nino, this was the 97-98 El Nino. You see this huge uh, sea surface temperature anomaly about the size of Europe, seven, eight degrees, and you see a bifurcation in this temperature anomaly. Actually, you see a, a Y circuit in it, maybe the triangle of the tip of the chestahedron. Galapagos is right here. I showed you this earlier on the mantle gravity anomaly map. This is a triple junction. Simultaneously, up here in the Guaymas Basin Rift, you also have a interesting sea surface temperature anomaly. And this is the, the peak, this is the peak El Nino temperature. If you look at the bathymetry, underlying bathymetry, over here, the Cucos Ridge and the Carnegie Ridge, there's Galapagos. You, does anybody see a, a Y or a delta in that configuration? So it, what we think is going on here is you're getting hydrothermal venting off of these ridges, and that's reflected in the sea surface temperature anomaly. So about to run out of time, it looks like. So that concludes our show. Um, I hope you enjoyed it. I just wanted to show you all those relationships and see if anybody had any feedback. All right.